seen bits of the cartoon show and... Oh, hold on. The movie is the one with Jeremy Irons that I've seen clips of, right? Where he's going insane. I don't know. That's the Dungeons and Dragons movie, but I think they made another one. Well, there's a movie with called... With Ray Liotta. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about then. They made a movie called uh, Darkest Dungeons, which is based off of a evangelical Christian like comic strip that was about how Dungeons and Dragons is actually a Satanist ploy to convert kids into demon worship. And they made a movie off of that like in 2008, I want to say. Because is this like a Christian movie or? Well, okay. So the filmmakers like, cause the comic book like didn't really reach its intended audience. Like, <laughs> what is the intended audience? I ask. Well, cause like apparently that guy sells a whole shitload of like Christian comics and they sell very well. But like <laughs> that one became like a bit of a thing in the Dungeons and Dragons community. Like everybody <laughs> thought it was fucking hilarious. So, I understand. So they bought the movie rights for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I understand now what you're getting at. And made the movie like straight faced. Like the entire the movie itself is like almost dead on a telling of what happens in the comic, but like that it's marketed toward the audience of like, wow, isn't this fucking stupid and ridiculous? You know what? That method of making a movie is maybe the answer to the like cynical sharknado purposely stupid movie. Yeah. Maybe that is how it works. You buy someone else's shit and say, we're just going to do this straight faced. It's kind of like airplane too, right? How they bought that like straightforward disaster movie yeah. and then just added a bunch of jokes. But for the most part, it's the same thing. It's almost like just doing that. Maybe that is the way of doing this like purposefully bad movie. It's a good way. And they got the guy who wrote the comics like approval for it. <laughs> Yeah, so. <laughs> oh God! Uh, there has to be a documentary about that. I don't. They're making documentaries about all sorts of movies. Why can't they? I've never even heard of this movie before. Should, it's. I would be glad to watch it sometime on here if you watch it and find it just enjoyable enough to see. <laughs> so yeah, it's available. What's it called? Uh, Darkest Dungeons. Darkest Dungeons. Well, it's, that's a hell of a story. It's oh, and oh my God, it's so fucking great! Like. There's a scene where it's just like, it's these two Christian girls. They're off in college for the first time and they go to their first class and they're like talking with a guy outside the class. And then you see like cool music starts playing and you see all these like punkish alt kids walking down the hallway. They're like, who are those guys? And it's like, those are the RPGers. We've been trying to get them kicked off campus, but they're just too popular. And I'm just, <laughs> it's the fucking best. I don't know. I have a feeling the guy that wrote that comic book is from Florida for some reason. I don't think so. I think he's from like the deep South or something, but not that South Florida is, is like its own thing. Once it's you, a different world pretty much. Yeah. Once you like cross the area into the ocean, it's just sort of like, yeah, Florida just needs to detach from the United States and slowly fall away. Cue that gif of Bugs Bunny with saw the saw. It. Yeah. Anyway, you know who else has a saw? I'm, I'm just going to wait and let you nail this transition. No, I'm not nailing it. I'm sawing it okay. in half because I have the saw. And you know what you saw earlier this week, which we are now going to see for this show. What? It's Legally Blonde! Whoa! Oh, boy. Guys, this is... This is, yeah, we're, this is Welcome to the Spectacular Film Podcast. Maybe um, we need writers. I, that, no. that would really solve Or maybe, you know, we should, like, get back to working out what we're going to say beforehand rather than just sort of improv it every time. But anyway, we're here now. That's what having writers is. But if you make the mistake of thinking that, you know, we're clever enough to actually think of a good thing to say anyway when we deliberately try... I mean, that's just going to be on you because I, I think that's patently, I think patently, it, patently false. It might be better than just sort of me not offering you a hand while you're flailing around trying to while I'm make drowning. random connections. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Max. I appreciate that. Of course. What are friends for? Um, but yeah, we're doing Legally, Legally Blonde. Bond. And surprisingly, this was not my pick. This was Austin's How pick. How is this surprisingly? Um Here's what I want listeners to do. You got to look up the Spectator Film Podcast on whatever device you're listening it on. 
or just on our website, right? And I want you to, or no, the list is on Letterboxd. I put up lists of both of our picks. And if you look at our picks, there's quite a disparity. Now, if Google is going to make some sort of like weird, they're going to stock your searches and make a taste profile of the movies you've selected, they're all horror movies. I have selected uh, horror movies as well, obviously for Spooktober, but I also selected To Be or Not To Be, which is a screwball comedy. I wouldn't call it a rom-com, but Le Million, musical romance-ish plot, right? I think this is right in line with, with some of my suggestions. Um, this is like a throwback classic movie in a lot of ways. Yeah, but not as much as a throwback because I was also noticing this looking at the episode list. I tend to choose more modern movies than you do right. just overall. Um, and this is definitely missing your mark by about 50 or 60 years from what you normally pick. So it is. It what, is are, what is the most recent movie I picked? I can't remember. Yeah. but <laughs> um, So, yeah, this was a bit of a shock when you were just like, need something a little different than Repo the Genetic Opera. How about we do Legally Blonde? And it's a very nice contrast, it is. I have to say. I have to say, during the pre-screening for this, it felt like my brain was taking a shower. I was just sort of like, ah. Oh. That was not what I expected you to say. No, but it That's felt like... interesting It was just like that, rinsing though. it out. I'm just like, this, this is nice. This is not something I was thinking of I was going to watch, but... Rinsing out the... The God knows what from yeah. Repo the Genetic Opera. Well, that's all we need to a... stop dunking on that movie because we did it maybe a little bit too much during the commentary for that movie. I didn't dunk on it as much. I was trying to defend it at points, and you were just like, "No, everything is terrible." But <laughs> you just you it, listen to the commentary for that movie. That's the discussion for that movie. Yes, um, this movie though is not about dunking on things um, for or, the most part. <laughs> For the most part. But um, it's about being a good person and not judging other people and, and uh, accepting this character. And finding out who you are and becoming true to yourself, independent of others. Which yeah. Is, Would you say this movie is a coming-of-age movie, then, um, actually? Kind of, but not in the traditional manner. Because like, yeah. in a way, she's already come of age, but this is sort of like a last-minute life change that ends up being her true calling. Well, she's still like in college. It's not quite last-minute, but it's like... It's just an... It's an interesting contrast we'll talk about throughout the movie where there's this clear arc of, I don't know what you'd call it, dependence on the man is the obvious thing. But in a more abstract sense, your character is not fully actualized in some way at the start of the story. And then if they go on a journey and have an arc, they are different because something, some change happened and it's been uh, sort of whether it originates from within them or something happens to them and it changes them from the outside, they are now a different person and it reflects that in their behavior. Yeah. Well, I think she starts off the movie as a perfect half. Like she's right. Well, this is what I'm saying though. Yeah. Right. Is like you have the contrast between that arc and then her behavior and how she like expresses herself never changes, which is interesting, but we'll, we'll talk about that during the course of the movie. But uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of explaining why I chose this, that's really just it, is the contrast. And I hadn't seen it in... I saw this in the theater. I did not, but go on. I mean, I can't remember shit about it or what I thought about it, but I saw this in the theater and I... I mean, I, I'm, I've been aware of it since forever, but just haven't even really engaged in thinking about it until maybe in the past few years when people start doing this, the whole like, you know, reclamation thing and talking about movies from their childhood and which ones are good or bad, right? It's a generational thing, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, every generation does that kind of, but yeah, we have a different outlet for it now that the internet exists and we can force other people to listen to our opinions on things. Um, What's your opinion then? Force uh, us to listen to it, sir. Legally Blonde, I didn't, I remember it being a thing. I didn't, I saw it around the same, a couple years later when Mean Girls was a thing too. Like those movies were, <laughs> which I also saw in the theater. I, I, <laughs> I do like Mean Girls. I'm going to go on record saying that that's a fun movie as well. Um, this year was nearly a national holiday for Mean Girls um, because October the 3rd fell on a Wednesday. So you had two movie references in one day. 
okay. You don't remember anything about Mean Girls, do you? On Wednesdays? I remember some things about it, but not that. Uh, on Wednesdays, we were pink. And the first time he talked to me, it was October 3rd. Those are two prominent lines from the movie, and they happened on the okay. same day. It was like a national holiday. Well, there you go. So many girls I knew were wearing all pink that day. It was wonderful. Um, and I was the only guy who understood what was going <laughs> on near me. Um, but, yeah, those these movies were, like, packaged together a lot, not, like, physically, but, like, if I was in an environment where I would be seeing one of those movies, the other one would probably be right around the corner. That's also something interesting I was thinking about that we can talk about during the commentary is like a weird cycle of like, I don't know what to call it. Not necessarily teenage, but like, like, uh, on the cusp of complete adulthood. Like I hate the term young adult. Girl, it's not young adult though. Cause now that is its own thing. And this is very much not yeah. that it's more like adult in the sense where they're not even, they're not even high schoolers. They're like, it's sort of like the graduate type of, age right and then they're just one step away from being their own person but it's that specifically in it seems like in the 90s in the mid to late 90s and then i guess early 2000s you find a number of these movies that are kind of like that that seem to be about mostly you know women of that age and then also marketed toward women primarily yeah i don't i was thinking about this what is the term besides women in general the very broad category what like who is this movie targeted toward what age demographic do you in think? terms of uh what they were thinking when they were making it yeah i mean it's sort of difficult to say without being more familiar with the marketing campaign because that's something we talked about um is like what this movie sets itself up as both in terms of your expectations or or like or how it just introduces itself to you on its own terms instead of just like, oh, it's a movie for girls opposed to when you, you're you actually watching it at the beginning, right? Yeah. So it's like, if you, the only marketing I'm aware of is the poster, right? So if you look at the poster, it has, it's very kind of generic yeah. looking. And it looks like one of those types of movies that we were just talking about. And it's kind of like not giving itself any sort of identity separate from that as far as i can tell except for the fact that it's it's reese witherspoon and she's wearing all pink i believe right yes so i i don't really know what would differentiate it in terms of like how it tries to interact with its audience before they're in the theater but again, I'm not really familiar enough with this genre. Well, the, ra- the rating also, PG-13, is an interesting thing because it excludes a younger crowd, like youngest possible. It doesn't make it a, like a fun for the whole family movie. Yeah, I can't think of anything like to... There's a lot of implied raunchy stuff in it. Um, like you have the Playboy bunny costume. You have the really like, I'm not saying it's out of place, but out of nowhere almost like sexual harassment scene. Right. Um, well, that's also uncomfortable. You have hot, the hot tub thing. Like there's mentions of sexuality in the movie, but there's right. nothing outright, which stops it from being an R rated raunchy comedy, which I think is honestly, maybe it's benefit. one of those things that had to be PG 13 because of some rule. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like the fact that, you know, the guy stands up and says you bitch and yeah. then runs out. Maybe that's something to do it, but there's not like, it's not like there's overt sexualization, which would I would assume is the thing that would trigger like the the ratings board to be like, because that's always the thing they overreact to in America, yeah. right? Um, Whereas, but, yeah, I, I don't really in, know. In Europe, there's uh, an answer to that question. In Europe, or at least in France, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey got like the equivalent of a PG rating in France. I don't know shit about P uh, or. Uh, I don't know shit about Fifty Shades of Grey, really, so I, a, I don't know. It's a bondage-focused it sexual movie, but yeah, it got a hard R here, and they're just like, ah, oh, the kids can see this in France. Rating systems are dumb and arbitrary. You should just watch things when you think you're ready to watch them. Sure. But also, uh, just in terms of how we're going to set up our discussion of this movie, I think talking about its audience is a good way into that, because the sort of paratextual element of a movie I think can change with time that passes and how it lives on in home video or whatever, right? And this movie 
sort of similar to Repo, right? Has a type of cult following, despite being, I think, quite successful yes. at the box office. I wouldn't even really call it a cult following. Like this movie's just kind of it is kind. Of, it cult is not the right term. It's well loved generally. This movie, like, I don't really hear people bash on Legally Blonde no, a lot when they're no. bringing it up. It's just like, oh, that movie was fun. But, but you do see people bringing it up in that way. That's like, in a in a in a way, it sort of seems like it's a revival of interest, right? Yes. Where it does not have the same... There's an assumption with all these articles or takes on it about being a uh, feminist movie uh, talking about how... Th- I guess the assumption is that it has lost a bit of its audience with time and maybe it's overlooked as a feminist movie is a lot of the point of this article. Or not this article, but articles in general. You can find any of them. Just look it up. And I think that's an interesting way to talk about how we're gonna sort of shift into discussing this movie because you know whose opinion i would really be interested in hearing on the idea of a feminist movie in general oh who max tell me uh the director of a movie called the love witch and uh, what's her name uh i, I can't remember off the top of my head Do you her have... name is anna biller i believe i think that's how it's pronounced okay yeah but anyway we'll link to this entry in the to this blog entry is what it is in our show notes but we're gonna sort of maybe try to I'm trying to think of the right way to phrase it. It's not like the feminist appra- like evaluation of this movie is false, but I think it's very easy as uh, this article, as this blog post we're talking about points out to sort of um, get swept away in discussing things on those terms when maybe it's more useful to be specific and uh, maybe more reflective on what, the term feminist movie and and the movie itself are actually doing before you actually start ta- talking about it in that way, yes. right? Also, for just a quick shout out, since we're going to be framing our discussion partially around this blog post, quick shout out to this director. Give The Love of Witch a watch if you haven't. It's a very solid, entertaining movie. Would you say that you loved it? Yes, I loved The Loved Witch. Speaking of things people definitely thought about saying and then crossed the line through. Anyway. <laughs> so hold on. I'm going to post this article, so I'm not going to you know go through reading all of it. But essentially, uh, I'm going to read probably... There are two passages I want to read. The first one is when she's talking about uh, specifically what the definition of feminism is, right? And she's talking about this in reference to Suspiria. So she, she says that feminism is not love of women. It's a political movement, right? And that is sort of the underlying idea, I think, in how we're going to talk about this movie as a feminist movie, because she's right. Using the term feminist movie to discuss something that merely loves its female characters or treats them as sort of equal partners with, with the male characters or simply doesn't hate them is not really a correct way to go about it, right? Well, uh, yeah, if I can remember a quote from that article, it was uh, like misogyny is not the opposite of feminism. Yeah. Like, like misogyny is hatred of women, whereas feminism is a political and social movement meant to advance women's rights and needs. in Within world. the world. Within the world, yes. Yeah. Like... I mean, I guess if you want to get literal, the opposite of misogyny is misandry, but that is a word that probably doesn't exist. Um, Well, that's another interesting thing, though, is you end up with all these weird, arbitrary-seeming binary oppositions, which is also, you know, and again, we're talking about feminism as this monolithic thing, but there's lots of different sort of approaches and ideas within it, right? Oh, let me tell you, as somebody who spends far too much time on Tumblr... Right. Like like any political movement, the, there is no like one truth held together in feminism. It's a right, general right. idea, and people projecting their own experiences onto right. it. Right, and like minded people grouping into smaller. So the idea of a binary in the first place is probably not even the way it should be approached. Yeah, right. But I think uh, another way, another passage, I think is useful is when she's talking about Suspiria. She's like, "What does?" the audience think about when watching Suspiria? Is it that they wish women had equal pay, equal representation in culture, 
were taken more seriously, had an easy, easier time negotiating with men, suffered less sexual object, objectification and harassment. Are the female characters in it living in a meaningfully realistic world of gendered politics? Are men in it implicated for their violence or for their unthinking privilege that they benefit from at the expense of women? And most importantly, do audiences viewing it suddenly understand how the world looks from the interior of a specifically female consciousness? Probably not. Well, I mean, that's a discussion for Suspiria. Yeah. But in, in terms of just in general... Suspiria will be the last episode of the Spectator Film <laughs> Podcast I do. Um, the 2018 one. Yeah. <laughs> We're never going to do the original one. Sorry. Anyway, Max has a pouty face on. I not want... <laughs> Listen, to all of you at home, I'm, I, I've am i heard the new Suspiria is a grand old movie. It's a great time. I'm not watching it. I'm still angry. Okay. That's your choice. I would say you're just, you're only denying the experience for yourself. Oh, I it fully agree good. with you. You don't have to. It's a, dumb, it's a dumb decision and a narrow-minded decision on my part, but I still am unable to get over that little hump. And like, from personal experience, I shouldn't. <laughs> Because I I thought the same thing about the Evil Dead remake, and I liked that movie. It was fun, but ugh, I'm dumb and stupid and don't like things. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> now that I got that out of my system. So I guess the last thing I want to directly quote from this is uh, the passage further down in the article when she is saying that, uh, you know, if critics are really interested in discussing feminism in cinema they need to pay attention to movies that declare themselves that way, you know? And instead of um, sort of injecting that terminology and that conversation into a movie, either because it has a strong female character or has a story where a female is empowered or, you know, any of the other things she's mentioning, right? There's a difference between feminism and simply having a movie where female characters are present in a way that is substantial and important and treated with respect, right? So then you, in our position, right, we wind up in this situation where now we're about to watch Legally Blonde, right? Yes, we are. And this is a movie that people talk about in that way where they're sort of re-eval- they're, they're uh, reviving the conversation about it in reference to this idea of feminism. So what is our our conclusions after watching the movie. Do we think this is a feminist movie or do we even want to frame the question as like a yes or no question? I don't really want to. I would say that because I know that this movie is held up even modernly um, in internet circles as like an example of just like, look, the, the joke might be that she's shallow and whatnot, but look, she's actually like she got to Harvard law school by her own academic merit. And like, right. She changes herself for the better and decides she doesn't need a man. And like this movie is presented in a feminist way. And I have said this before, and this is the only time I'll bring it up during the screening, but I am much more likely to trust a woman on her opinion of what, if something is feminist or not, than a man's opinion. Um, right. But I think this movie, it's, it's hard. hard. It's hard to say, but because, well, this is the thing we were talking about where it's like, if we have to end up on a yes or no scale with this, oh yeah, we okay. end up on the side of the scale that's like leaning towards yes, but we're not all the way at the end of that scale because this movie sets up, seems to sets up like feminist goals for itself. Right. And it's not even having to do with the romance plot. Right. Yeah. It's, it's this idea of like, I mean, it is related to that, but it's more that she is entering a male arena and then succeeding on her own terms. Right. And that is, you know, in terms of, again, we're not familiar really with the marketing, but that's what the movie declares from the outset that this is what sort of it's going to be. And this is the path she goes along and she achieves what she wants to do without compromising herself. Right. That is why we would say that it falls on that side of the scale. But the feminism is not complete, really. Or at least, let's phrase it this way. If the movie succeeds because of its energy and its willingness to embrace this character and sort of, you know, be inclusive in that way, it also has sort of 
really like painful flaws because they they go exactly against that ethos at the same time. Well, that's the other thing about this movie because overall, I would say I like this movie. So do I. Um, that's just the general like, wow, this was an enjoyable comedy film critic part of me. On the me being a bisexual male part of this movie, this movie is problematic and I know that word is overused, but I like it. Um, this movie's portrayal of uh, gay characters is astonishingly... You know what? Bad. Oh, go. No, no, no. No, no, finish what you're saying, but I just had this idea that just like exploded in my mind, although it's obvious. Then go for it, because okay. you've already thrown me off my thought. Sorry, but you're saying like in terms of gay characters, it's like, yeah, the two side characters that just appear momentarily in this, they are both gay, and those are the ones that seem to be treated the worst. Yeah. It's like, because this movie, I think, does a fairly successful job of propping up our female character and yeah. having her succeed. Um, however, it also feels the need to kick other downtrodden people in order to elevate her up higher, and I don't yeah. really get that. Well, it's like, it's the idea of like punching... Upwards versus punching downwards. And the movie doesn't need that. Yeah. You could, there are three scenes in this movie or like there's three LGBT characters in this movie. All of them are jokes. Um, one literally shows up for two seconds to punctuate the end of a thing. That's already a joke that didn't need to be there. The other one is a semi reoccurring character who is treated as like, but that's not even a joke. Are you talking about the one? Her name is Enid. Yeah. That character, right? That's not even a joke. She's just, evil apparently she's just an awful person well i think it's i don't know if it's the movie being like do you think it's we're not one of those annoying feminists oh god it's like a feminazi quote unquote like thing where it's like that's the implication where she's like the aggressive militant one yeah. oh geez yeah i mean that so yeah this movie's problematic but those bits aside when i can contain my nausea when they're on screen if i can forget they exist in the rest of the movie the rest of the movie is enjoyable, but like, yeah. well, <laughs> I mean, you could still take the good without neglecting those. Yes. You know, a movie. And as much as I hate to say it, I grew up around this time and that was the common attitude. It was like when Ellen DeGeneres and queer eye from, for the straight guy, the original show were like America's touchstones for what gay people are like. Yeah, it's like and it's crazy to think that when we were kids, she yeah. almost lost her career entirely because of that shit. Yeah, I'm not even entirely familiar with it, but just hearing like, you know, people who were older casually drop that sort of as a thing that happened. Yeah, and you're like, what? But why? It's completely baffling. But it's also like, I don't know. It it does sort of leave you at a loss for words because. It makes me the happy good parts that parts so, are so good. Yeah. It makes me happy that society has progressed this much in this relative short of a time. Um on the other hand, just because a movie is good and you like it and it's fun doesn't mean you can't point out the parts that it doesn't nail in terms of lifting up people who are downtrodden and or oppressed. Right. And I think, you know, it, they're making a third movie in this in this franchise oh, have either of us seen the sequel because i know no, i haven't yeah no. okay i mean and we were talking the other day how it'd be really obvious for them to make it her running for president or something which wouldn't necessarily be bad but that's the clear choice right but you know i think it's it'll be interesting to see how that happens in real time what and how it, what that marketing it was unfolds. That, what if it was that and then when hillary clinton was cheated by the electoral college like they were just like oh fuck we can't make this movie now I don't know if the movie was in production it's on. when that happened. I'm sure it's been something like, hey, you're going to make another Legally Blonde yet? Ever since whenever, right? Yeah. But, you know, who knows? I, As far as I can tell, it's still, like, early in production. And I don't know anything about it or haven't really heard anything about it. I just looked up the writers of this movie and saw on their IMDb page that they're working on Legally Blonde 3. That's what I'm saying. No, like, what do you think you doubt that there was a screenplay in a box that they're just like, Clinton wins this election. We're going to make this fucking movie and make a bajillion fucking dollars. It's going to be great. I don't know. Cause I think it makes more money after Clinton having lost the election. 
I don't know. It depends on the time Frankly. of the release. But I mean, people love this movie too, so it's hard to play that into it. The, the fan base of this movie is very active. Yes. Still. Uh, yeah. This, and lots of people our own age. Well, yeah. It recent, semi recently got a Broadway musical adaptation, which is a barrel of laughs. Uh, also, keeps some of the weird, slight homophobia, but like in a slightly less nauseating way. I, I, um, we're just going to talk about it because I don't think it's slight. It's like a slap in the face. No, the musical I'm saying. Oh, okay. It does it in a slightly less nauseating way. Um, but still, they, um, whatever. No, they, they may, it's more of a, like, because you can't like the, the pool boy being gay is a plot point of this movie, unfortunately. Um, right. So rather like they have a song which the chorus is, is he gay or European? And they're trying to figure <sighs> it out. But um, they don't just like publicly out him. Like, it, it, it's weird. Whatever. Anyway. The well, that's for our musical Yes. When we when podcast. we graduate to doing Broadway musicals, even though they'll probably be really annoyed if we're in the... <laughs> when we graduate from Harvard with our podcasting degrees, is that what you were going to say? No, I was oh. not <laughs> at all. So I was the only one thinking that. Yes. As me whistling awkwardly. Anyway, um, yeah, but when we graduate to doing Broadway musicals and to do a live podcast yeah. when they're doing the musical, I'm sure they'll appreciate that a lot. Right. So before we begin, I'm just going to say that I would encourage anybody who really likes this movie or somebody who is not aware of it at all or whatever to check out the article in reference to this movie because it, you know, again, it is always interesting when we watch a movie that has like a culture attached to it right and with this movie it is this culture of like the hashtag feminist thing and sort of thinking about okay are do these claims hold up under scrutiny when we compare it to uh what anna biller is talking about in this article in this blog post right or is it something where that reveals certain weaknesses in what it does yes okay to both okay. um but yeah, I just want to clarify that the article does not directly reference Legally Blonde to, to avoid confusion. Not that I'm aware of, yeah. Yeah, but um, it's just we found it to be a useful article for a lens for looking through. And frankly, something I think it's worth continuing to use if yeah. we, when, whenever we're doing a movie where this is a discussion we're going to have. Right? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean it needs to be the only one, but it's definitely a useful one. Max, so. it is the only one. Okay. Can we start the movie now? Okay. And here we are. You should have just seen a lion roar in your face. Max, is, we're watching this in 3D, and Max is very scared. Yeah, I'm terrified at the moment. Oh, my God. this. The, we were talking yesterday about how, like, this movie instantly, like captures the early 2000s <laughs> yes as cringeworthy as it was you think this uh this font they're using does that with like the pink sort yeah. of like uh sort of feathered glow around it well that's like the movie kind of wants it both ways and it kind of succeeds in that where like it wants to unironically embrace that style because like that was what was popular at the time but it also like is aware that everybody was making fun of that in general Right. I mean, I don't know if it's because it was popular at the time or more that it was just, that is what L does. Well, right. And, well, you're, when you mention that though, you bring up a good point about the movie that I don't think we talked about in the, in the sort of introduction to it, which is like the goal of this movie, if, if we're going to boil it down, right, is essentially it, it, it's a very clever concept because it's taking this Barbie stereotype, right. Yeah. And humanizing it over the course of this story and without the character actually compromising on the way they behave, demonstrating to you that they can achieve something in this sort of masculine, in this male-dominated sphere, right? Without having to actually become more masculine themselves. Yes. So it's like the triumph of this specific, you know, vision of femininity, as much as it is a stereotype, as something that is, is humanized and something that it asks the audience to respect as much as anybody else. Yeah, which 
I think is commendable, but like at the same time, like, I don't know. It's hard looking back because like, this is when I grew up and just like, I remembered this song playing on the radio constantly. I, this one? Yes. Yeah. Um, I remember a lot of like, I don't know, a lot of the pop culture things in this, like they were present at the time as well. So like, if I cringe at any of that, it's more of just like, oh God, I remember growing up in the early 2000s. Jesus. It's because you feel old. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, interestingly enough, I don't think, I think this movie it weirdly ages very well despite the sort of time stamped things in it where it feels like it works really well with this movie, you know? And I can't, I'm not quite sure why. It's I almost it's like a period about the movie. piece. Kind yeah, of. kind of. Um, not that the, any of this is real. I mean, this isn't fucking realistic. Oh at no, all, this right? movie, this movie does goof up like literally everything, which right. But it's, I mean, stuff like that with the, just the way the production is designed to begin with in that set, right? That's clearly deliberate, but it's somehow it still captures this sort of time capsule feeling in a strange way. Also, this dog is an excellent bruiser. Actor. Excellent dog actor. I think they had to like specifically lobby to get this dog or something. And the director wanted this dog specifically. Well, yeah. And it's one dog throughout the movie. A lot yeah. of movies use a different dog for one character. But nope, it's a singular dog and a very good dog actor. Yeah. Not the best dog actor. We all know the best dog actor. but Yeah. But, uh, y- you know, I think... <laughs> we commented yesterday that that's probably how that's literally the actor's headshot. But Maybe. But uh, I wanted to comment real quick about how there's something like very vaguely City of Oz-ish to me about the sorority house where everybody is running around doing everything and they're very busy, but everybody is like getting ready for something, it feels like. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, I, it's a hard thing for me to sort of peg down, but there's some sort of similarity there. And it feels very, you know, produced in like a classic Hollywood sort of way. Which is interesting. Which again, this movie reminds me of classic Hollywood for a number of reasons. It reminds me a lot of um, Mr. Smith goes to Washington uh, for you know yeah, probably kinda. surface level things. But again, it's the same idea. You take this sort of stock type character represented by uh, Jimmy Stewart, and then you drop him into this real world sort of situation and see wh- how he does. Yeah. And both movies validate sort of those characters and and humanize them along the way. Here we get the first moment of that in a significant way. And I really like this moment specifically because it demonstrates that she's smart without actually changing the way she expresses herself, which again, we talked about how this movie doesn't quite cross the finish line sprinting. And one of the things it does is it kind of like flip flops a little bit in how it treats the Elle Woods character, I think. Well, I think that's like, that's a good example. Like she is knowledgeable in the thing that she's passionate. Like, and you can just be like, Oh, it's the dumb blonde knows a lot about clothes, but like, that's her major in college. But, but also not only that, it's like, that is a blonde. That's a very blonde thing, but she's smart about doing that thing, which is why that's such a strong way to introduce her. Like they, they mentioned early on and they kind of forget later on that, like, fashion merchandising is her major in this like so it makes sense that she'd be very aware of it and like know the trends and be able to tell yeah. when some sleazy clerk and is you know what being like, that's the other thing you said sleazy clerk it's like it's not just that she is doing expressing something that she's into and she's smart about it and she knows what she's talking about it's like a social component too because the whole thing this movie flips on is the stereotype of like the completely socially oblivious sort of uh lack of self-awareness that you would associate with the dumb blonde, right? Yeah. But it's like, in that moment, it's not just that she knows a lot about this thing, it's that she's competent enough on a social level to understand this person is trying to take advantage of her. And she, she shuts it down. Which is wonderful. It's a right. great, it, it is a great way to establish your lead character early on. It's just yeah. like, you can think of her like this, but you're wrong. Right. She does have flaws, She's dating a man who wears sunglasses at night. Yeah. I, th- I think it's important to go back and, and fetch that detail. <laughs> it's not the 80s anymore, so you can't get away with that. Um, Could you ever get away with that? Yes, they made a song about it in the 80s. 
I'm not going to sing because you've forbidden, yeah, forbidden me from singing on this podcast. Oh, that's podcast. right. Good. No singing. No singing here. Thank you. I'll get there one day, listeners. Don't you worry. No, I think this moment is very well acted, by the way. Which, I mean, I think we can both agree that Reese Witherspoon is the best part of this movie. Oh, yeah. she's. I think this movie might have flopped terribly without her. She's very... Yeah. I mean, she elevates the script to being better than I think it would be on paper. Even though it does go out of its way to do some of the things we've praised this movie for in terms of her character, it's the way that she plays these very like heightened stereotypical moments that is what sells it all and kind of wraps this movie together despite how uh, sloppy it feels sometimes. That's a great cut, yeah. by the way, by the editor. But even that moment, it's like... It, I don't know how to describe how challenging this type of performance seems to me because I'm not really an actor, but it's like, it's hard to play a caricature, right? And, and do something that's inherently over the top without making it dumb, right? Yes. And it's really hard to walk the line between embodying a caricature and also being an actual human in your performance. And she does that in every scene. And she does that in big scenes where she has to play really broad, big emotions like like this scene, right? Well, and like you could, I think this is a good time to get into the fact that this movie is kind of operating on two levels at all points. Where like it's easy to interpret this as just like, oh, the dumb blonde is having an over emotional reaction to getting dumped. Isn't that silly? But like this is a reasonable thing. Like if the person that said they would love yeah, you forever, out of the blue. It's just like, oh, well, I can't marry you because you're not pro professional enough for me to marry to go into my chosen profession. It's literally because she's too blonde. Yeah. It does the whole Marilyn Jackie comparison, yes. which, again, we all know is bullshit because Marilyn Monroe wasn't stupid. <laughs> no. Uh, again, this movie, I think, you know what? I didn't really think of watching that this movie that way, but in reference to the idea of Marilyn Monroe as well as embodying that stereotype but also at the same time 100% subverting a stereotype because she was never actually like that. Yes. But this is also maybe a good moment to bring up that uh, this movie's... <laughs> this movie is a little bit limited in uh, the scope of what it it tackles in terms of Elle's character where she has lots of privileges that seem to go not, I don't want to say unacknowledged, but well, she unaddressed. Get, well, I like the fact that like by the movie, her parents are only just like slightly just like, no, oh, you shouldn't go to law school. But when she decides to anyway, they're just like, Oh, we can afford it. Who cares? Yeah. Like it's, she's a woman, but it's also like, they're, especially her parents' attitude, it's like the whitest thing. <laughs> it's like the yeah. whitest thing ever. Like she, the challenge is not her affording to go to Harvard. Yeah. It's that you're oh, not going to get in. You could, yeah, you could make more money being a model. And the parent characters are literally in the movie for a grand total of ten seconds, and it's a punchline for the end of the movie, which is totally worth it in my opinion. Yeah, that that's a good moment. That's like one of the few moments of like narrative conservation throughout the movie is that that payoff to that joke with yeah. the dad. Uh, cuz again, this screenplay is not like the most solid screenplay structurally. It, Even though it gets through the scene. Yeah, scenes, it's perfectly it, suitable for yeah. the movie, but like And you get the beats you need for the story, but it's not like you know, it's not like an expertly crafted thing. I like Reese Witherspoon, I like Selma Blair like yeah, there are great performances in this movie, but but one thing we didn't really talk about and I wanted to go back to in terms of that breakup scene is how the movie it's sometimes hard to pin down the movie's opinion of L, right? Where it tells us certain things about her and then it clearly wants us to to sympathize with her in a lot of different ways, right? But at the same time, it seems to get try to cash in on these easy, lazy jokes about her being a dumb blonde. It's like, well, the point of this is that she's not. Yeah, it does, like, grab for the low-hanging fruit occasionally, but I guess, like, I, I shouldn't applaud the movie for this, but, like, the majority of the times it doesn't or it subverts that low-hanging fruit in, an in, like, a funny and clever way. Right. But 
it does occasionally grab it. And those are the jokes that kind of fall most flat in the movie for me. Right. And I think it's something where, again, it, it flips back and forth from moment to moment, which is part of our like minor frustrations with this. And I think also her friends are a great example of that because they're portrayed as like vapid sorority girls. Right. Yes. And then you get this amazing moment where this character is about to speak the native language of the person she's talking to. Yeah. I'm not sure which, which sort of East Asian language it is. Um, if we're going stereotypical, it's what either Korean or, uh, uh, yeah, it's literally just speaking foreign language in the subtitles. Oh, great. But anyway, or Taiwanese, one of the two, but, uh, right. But point is, it's like it more important than the language itself. It's the fact that it just, the movie makes no, pays no attention to the fact that she does. She is fluent in a different language. Right. Yeah. Um, it's very clever that joke, right? And the movie doesn't do that as much as I want it to. And if it did that more, it would be kind of amazing. Yes. Like that is the joke about the the stereotypical stupid sorority girl, I right? Like that what practically deformed. <laughs> but again, also that's like another joke where it's like you talked about how it props up L, right? Yeah. But it props her up using other people as props. And it punches downward or you know? upwards. Like th- that's I'm fine with that because I don't care about anybody making fun of the Vanderbilts. Like go ahead with that. Right. That's that's fine. But also that woman is just a woman and she's it's not like L isn't privileged. Yeah, either, no, I know that. Know? And we have to acknowledge that we have our movie. reference to the graduate here. Yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> I could say the dad is a stealth good performance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for his total of 10 seconds in the movie. He's same with excellent. this, same with the uh, guidance counselor. Yeah. There's a, this yeah. movie, by the way, we should mention this after we're, we, we've started bringing this up. This movie is so well cast. Yeah. I don't think I disagree with, oh. And it makes me very sad that the screenplay is not structured in a way where more characters get like, time to do things like it flashes back and forth between certain side characters that are really vibrant and you want to see more of, but I guess it's okay to, to leave people wanting more, I guess. Oh, but okay. So this is a good example of what we're talking about, right? I once had to judge a tidy whitey contest for Lambda capo, whatever. Trust me. I can handle anything. Yeah. No one in the right mind would say that. No, Right. And, but we know Elle is smart because of what she does in the movie. Right. Well, well and that kind of comes back like her, not like her referencing events that have happened in her sorority or fraternity. Like she does that during the court case later on in the movie. Right. But it's like because that's how she socializes, like that's how she's trying to relate what she's thinking to other people. And, and I think that's fine. But yeah. also, like, I think the thing that I'm keying in, in on here is that the dumb blonde thing is like a ditzy thing. It's yeah. like, I'm oblivious of my surroundings and I, 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 I am completely unaware of what's going on around me. So when she does things like that and it seems like she is completely unprepared for when people are like, what are you talking about? It makes her seem stupid and like socially crippled, <laughs> but she's not, but she's not Yeah, right. And this is the thing where it's like, if you want to make jokes about her being the blonde stereotype, it feels a lot of the time like some of them are just lazy, you know? It's like you could probably find a way to do that without making it also seem like she's completely oblivious, you know? But I guess the real thing is that her performance is so good that it it kind of just carries you through every scene, you know? I don't think there's a, a moment where where Reese Witherspoon is not exciting to watch in this movie. <laughs> Who did she? Didn't she say she gets one of the Coppola? <laughs> yeah, she got one of the Coppolas to direct it. There's a lot of like <laughs> clever jokes or yeah. throwaway references in this movie too that are just weird and funny. It would actually be hilarious if they had this was shot as like a, a, a like a B unit or n- <laughs> like where it's like it was shot by one of the Coppolas. They actually did it just yeah. as a fun joke.
Yeah, and like this is another good example. Like she is learning stuff. She is applying her brain power and like <laughs> then you have scenes like this and this like is silly. Well, I mean, also these jokes work well though. Not only because of her performance, which is amazing in this yeah. video. This video is like a like an acting highlight reel for Reese Witherspoon. Um but it's like it's like those jokes work because there is a sense of humor about it that there seems to indicate some level of like self-awareness. But also at the same time, she's sending a video of herself in a bikini saying all this. And then you cut to like the group of men watching it, yeah. which in itself is, is worth noting. Oh, this is probably the highlight reel of the movie for most people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that move, that moment is just kind of amazing. It is. Although honestly, I, w I was listening to the commentary on this cause I have this on iTunes. I bought this. And by the way, the commentary, it came with two. Really? And the one with the cinematographers and um, I believe the costume designers and uh, production director. Uh, the, that commentary is amazing. But the one with Reese Witherspoon on it, unfortunately, I think they talk about how the person who did that kept actually pinching her ass during that scene. Oh, God. So it's like, oh, Christ, Really? Yeah, I mean, no. that's a bit of a bummer, but uh, <laughs> confetti. Yay. By the way, it's almost impossible to get a 179 on that test, apparently. Because well, yeah. it's a 180 score, I think, I read. Well, th that's the point. She actually is smart. Right. Like, the movie goes out of its way to tell us that again. But then again, the only reason she really gets in is because of the yeah. perverted male gaze. Which okay. Okay. I mean, I know the movie, it, I like that it's just you cut to a room full of like white middle-aged to old men and they don't know what to make of it, right? But then you immediately get these men making obviously insincere yeah. like arguments for her getting in based on the fact that she wears a bikini. And the joke here is that of course these people wouldn't find her achievements worthwhile is the joke that's being made. Yeah. And we know that it's insincere because we take that for granted. Uh, it's, it's like it does some things right, but also at the same time, it like, it kind of seems to pull the rug out from underneath its own feet. Right. I wouldn't say it pulls it. It, it wants to have it both ways and it succeeds sometimes and doesn't succeed other times. Or it's, there's like this weird ambiguity about it, which I don't think is intentional. You know? I think it might be. I think it might be an attempt to be just like, if you, view this movie as somewhat sexist order. They can point out to all the good things that they do, but like, I don't know if you, if it did it all the way, you'd have those annoying people being like, Oh, this is an annoying feminist movie. Like, I don't think it has to be that way though. I mean, it's all about your own creativity when you're making it. It is, but this was a relatively safe way to play it. And I think it hits the right note. I would say 60% of the time. And it, I'm just saying, I'm just commenting that the ambiguity is there. I know, you know, and in like, I'm well, here, okay, here's the other thing. Is it, maybe we're jumping, we're taking too many things for granted in, in our own sort of assumptions, right? Yeah. Is it necessarily problematic in any sense that, that her body lets her succeed in a certain way? Or if she does that intentionally? Um, if she's doing it intentionally, which they never really specify. I don't think so. They do that either. Yeah. Um, but if it's brushing over her academic achievements, then yes. If it's yes, that's what I'd say. If it's commenting on the fact that even though she's academically smart enough to get into Harvard law school, the only reason they let her in is because she's hot. Then like, I think that's an interesting commentary, but it doesn't go far enough. Either. See, I guess the thing is the movie is kind of, it's demonstrating that there is a virtue to her character. That is a virtue in everyone else, right? Yeah. But to sort of fixate on the things that we already take for granted about the stereotypes, right? I guess. We're yeah. talking about her big boobs and everything and her blonde hair, right? That To have that be a thing that plays more of a role in her success, I think is not the way to go. And again, maybe we're just reading that scene wrong, but that subtext is there in that scene. So whatever conclusion you draw from it, it's something the movie is is doing, and it's sometimes hard to draw 
like a concrete conclusion about the movie's opinion of her from scene to scene. Also, speaking of a, a loss of like, you know, uh, conservation of narrative detail, it feels like that character is going to show up again, and now yeah. he's gone. What I don't under so spoilers to our listeners. I have some friends who have gone through law school who have studied through law school. Is one of them Oz Perkins? No, that's um, so fucking weird. Yeah, it is weird that Oz Perkins shows up in this movie um, multiple times, but. Law students party. Law students aren't like all snooty stuck up like assets. They're still doing stuff like this. And this is another thing where the movie caricatures up everything. I mean, it's a movie playing in broad strokes, but that's fine. But uh, this is an important moment, Max, because uh, we are, we have just been introduced to Enid. Yeah. Who I think is what our character that we are annoyed at, at what happens with the most. Because what did she say she just did? She is what? She said she's like a black belt, right? And then she said that she started a national campaign against... For lesbians against drunk driving. Okay. I know that L scored a 179 on the test. Yes. But come on. Does that not seem way more impressive? No, she is... It, that's it's not... so immensely difficult, the idea of doing that. That, like... Her char- this part isn't problematic, I don't think. Like no. her, her saying she's like has she studied yeah, she's as a major in women's studies with the emphasis on the history of combat. Like, that's cool. <laughs> I would fucking love to hear this person talk about the history of women in combat. I would love right. to hear that shit. It's later on when it like drives up the right. crazy lesbian feminist angle, which right. I get annoyed with her well, character. Well, it begins there, and then the moment it does do a reaction shot where it seems like she's just as... She rejects gel L like everyone else. That's when yeah. it becomes a problem. Also, we got to point out the matching outfits with Bruiser and L. It's a joke they never really draw attention to. No, but I love <laughs> but it. But it's great. Um, but again... We, well, they never show I, her dressing him up, so it's almost like the dog is just... <laughs> coordinating the outfits with her which is hilarious but like i don't know i like the dog the dog is a good character it, i like the dog too bruiser but anyway i, I mean have a in, friend who named her chihuahua after that but oh wow so again yeah this movie is the fandom for this movie is alive and well yes um that third one is gonna make a lot of money <laughs> uh anyway in terms of enid's character right it is just It is, again, another weird instance of the movie demonstrating the value of this person and then repeatedly insisting that they be reduced to some sort of stereotype, right? And it's just, it's frustrating that that happens, you know? Because this movie, like we've been talking about, the energy of it and the reason why it's so much fun to watch is how Reese Witherspoon, you know, just embodies this character in very much, uh, like wins over your your support immediately for her. Yeah. And it's like, you want this movie to continue that momentum, you know? This is not a movie that that draws energy from criticizing and, like, slapping people down. No, and it does that a lot. And yeah. It, the movie kind of screeches to a halt when that happens where it doesn't need to. Where, like... Yeah. It's not just that it's problematic. It's that it's literally, like... It feels like it's ideologically inconsistent with the rest of the movie yeah like the exact opposite of what the rest of the movie does especially since like a lot of the humor in this movie is a subversion of the stereotypical fish out of water thing you'd expect from ellie's character right the fact that it needs to create such generalized stereotypes and then beat them down in order to have other comedic moments i think is a detriment to the movie as a whole yeah but but here we have another really great side character. Yes. Stromwell, Professor Stromwell. <laughs> Oz Perkins. Uh, and by the way, this, we were talking about this during the screening. This moment, I feel like, set up my expectations for this movie to be so high th- when I revisited it earlier this week. And then I was cu- so disappointed that it didn't really come up. Because here's the thing. So this movie, we can look at it at, as sort of metaphorically putting Elle's character on trial. And we, the audience, are judging her, right? And the movie demonstrates throughout this story that, like, her character, again, is is worthy of the same respect and is a human like everyone else. And she doesn't have to compromise to please anybody in that it asks us to to, uh, respect that and embrace her regardless of her sort of idiosyncrasies. 
and actually, you know, for her in idiosyncrasies, it celebrates the fact that she's a blonde in that sense. But again, that moment is interesting. That line is interesting because it suddenly places that, that question of like who's right or who's wrong or your own sort of competence and capabilities as something that will affect other people and will have consequences for other people that might change their lives. And we see that a little bit with Paulette. And we see that again with Ali Larder's character, but not in a way that sort of picks up this thematic thread in a way that I feel is like we needed one, powerful. We needed one or two more scenes with her. We needed like her slowly. Oh, with Stromwell? Yeah. I yeah, think. I mean that too. We needed a couple more scenes of her just like not necessarily becoming a mentor, but just like a far off like figure that knows like yeah. how how hard it is to succeed in this male dominated sexist yes, industry. Yes, very much like like you know reflections of the same thing. You know where again she is antagonistic, but we see in a certain sense that she winds up being like, uh, you know, the bedrock through which L grows as a person is, is, you know, interacting with this other professor, by the way, her performance is just, it just has to be said that it's really fantastic, you know? Uh, but you feel like this is going to be like the John Hausman type of character in the paper chase. And it's going to be that like back and forth challenging relationship. Right. Yeah. And that, you know, you will see L grow specifically in relation to this really awesome character who kicks ass in their first scene. And then they don't really come back. No, they, she comes back much, much later on when you don't get to see their relationship grown because apparently she respects her. Yeah. By that point in the but movie. But we don't. We don't get to see that. I mean, the movie shows us that Elle has changed, but we just have to take, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a very nice way to introduce Luke Wilson into the movie. Sorry, Luke. Oh, God. By the way, uh, you know how I joked about this movie pulling a Halloween and painting the leaves? Yeah. So they literally did that. By yeah. the way, look at how green this fucking scene is. Well, yeah. It's just, it's, by the way, there was a guy up in this tree. Dropping leaves? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can tell. But I love that, too. As somebody who's lived in New England my entire life, like, no, that's not how it happens. Oh, my God. It's fall. Yeah. <laughs> But that's so amazing. And I mean, unless you're really looking for it, you don't see it because that's just the fun of like, you know, that low budget filmmaking thing. And it's really fun to think about this as like a low budget type of movie. Yeah. Well, Watson, I, I don't know the budget of this movie, but I guarantee it wasn't low budget. It wasn't low budget, but they had a number of things changed during the production that sort of altered the way they had to work, you know, and, and, and that sort of made it, more like that type of movie in the production. Because it's not like Reese Witherspoon was a nobody, you know, or I, that's a bad way of saying it. It's not like she had no career up until this point, you know? No, definitely not. I think she'd been acting since she was like 12 or 13. Yeah, but I don't know. Oh. You know, when I saw him Ugh. appear in the movie... For the first time, it's just like so annoying that you know he's the love interest yeah. immediately. I mean, I like the idea of have. I kind of would have preferred, I don't know. He doesn't need to be in the movie. I like the idea of, or he doesn't need to be a love interest. I'm fine with his character. Like, Yeah, not at all. Her befriending a TA and like that gives her like a little motivation to keep going forward. Like she gets tips from that and like he helps her out in the end. Like it doesn't need to be a love interest thing, especially when like, no, so and much it's so of your movie fucking annoying at the end when it just is for no reason. So much of your movie is based off of the whole thing. She's getting away from the love interest, right? Yeah, of getting away from love interest and becoming yeah. your own person. It's just another example of how the movie like slaps in these things that are just the exact opposite. I <laughs> just hallucinated. Yeah, this movie, by the way, is hashtag quotable. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Yes, it is. It absolutely is. That I wouldn't say. I just hallucinated. It is. <laughs> one of those lines, but yeah. So are you okay? <laughs> no, but the one where she's talking about how if somebody said uh, orange is the new pink is seriously disturbed. <laughs> There's a lot of good lines in this movie. By the way, shout out to uh, Selma Blair, who also does a really good job. Yes, and like kind of shout outs to the movie because like you could have just written her as the villainous woman the entire time. Right. And not have her ever become friends with Ali? That is something the movie does really well, too. 
It's like, you know, that like, reconciliation. I believe their reconciliation and I believe they would become friends after this. Like, and the fact that at the end, you know, that Selma Blair's character is, has reached a point where she's, she's finished her arc and she's happy and she's satisfied without. Yeah. I, I guess Selma Blair's yeah. character kind of had the arc that I wanted Ellie to have. But, you want them both to have it. Yes. I want everybody to be a strong, independent woman who doesn't need no man. Like, that's that's all I want for the character. Except in this movie. for uh, except for Nail Lady. Nail Lady deserves the UPS guy with a big package. For for uh, Jennifer Coolidge and, yeah. and not Bruce Campbell. Yeah, I want that to be Bruce Campbell. Like, what was the phrase we used? You, Where it's you like, said like your brain auto corrects it to Bruce Campbell <laughs> whenever he shows up, and that's a very good way of putting it. It's like my fate, like. I just look at it and I'm like, his face is going to just change into Bruce Campbell's <laughs> face the longer I look at it. The guy who plays the UPS man in this He's movie. Like the evil Bruce Campbell he, from Evil Dead 2. Yeah, he is a stunt Slightly double, different. A slightly different Bruce Campbell. But yeah, and then we looked it up and then he's actually one of the mini ashes in, from uh, Army of Darkness. Yes, so he has worked with Bruce Campbell before. It wasn't just us going insane. <laughs> Can you imagine if that was Bruce Campbell? That I would love this movie even more it's like that'd be so amazing it's like when i was very young and i saw the uh spider-man movies and, and you're the, just like who is this guy yeah and who can, is just strangely super interesting and shows up in the movie each one of the movies as a different role and then like after i watched the evil dead movies and going back and watching those I'm like hey it's bruce campbell okay good right. times but yeah and again another great actor showing up in a supporting role jennifer coolidge um I mean, I like her character. I wish, again, we, we were talking about uh, this during the pre-screening, but... Uh, three, oh, my God, Connecticut. Oh, God. Yay, fuck you, Connecticut. Fuck you. <laughs> but anyway... Well, okay, um, this is a thing I like, where it's just like... She's not... She doesn't follow the beauty standards I follow, but she's not going to put this girl down. She's not going to be like, oh, she's ugly and disgusting because I don't like her. It's like, no, she's an attractive lady, even if we have different types, like that's fine. I wish the movie was more subtle with that more often. Right. But also it's like, Hey, not Bruce Campbell. How are we doing? I think his name is Br even Bruce. His oh, name okay. is Bruce Smith. I think <laughs> the most generic last thing you can have, but it's so close. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I like that too. Again, mm -hmm. and that's a detail thing where it's like the other details seem to like diverge in such a strangely like opposite way, you know, it feels like this movie was like somebody went into certain scenes and then rewrote details. And then you're, it's like whiplash just flying back and forth. I guess. What do you think of the nail technician character, by the way? I think she's Jennifer fun. Coolidge. Yes. Well, yeah, I, I guess I didn't finish what I was saying, but, yeah. um, I wish she was yelling more at the dude. Yeah. That because I love it when she yells and I think it's hilarious. Well, you'd think that'd be her character, but it's surprisingly her character is kind of the opposite of Elle's journey where it's like, I need to find out how to get a man by myself. Like, yeah. A, rather than I need to find myself without a man. Right. But also it's like in a, in a strange way, it's sort of accomplishing a, a similar thing because it's like it's this idea of finding a type of confidence to get a thing that you want and yeah. realize what you want without relying on something else. So she is able to not rely on L and sort of not rely on the sort of standard of beauty that she recognizes in, yeah. in L, right? And is able to act on her her own desires, I guess. I don't know. That's an interesting way to look at it, I guess. Oh, God. I, I love this moment, too. <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> this movie, like, I don't know. This movie has really good reaction shots. It does, too. but like, also, like, to an almost unrealistic degree. <laughs> like, I mean, this movie isn't really. No, it's not realistic realism. at all. It's a Frank Capra esque American fable of the American dream. Somebody achieving Some, the American dream. Somebody, somebody who's already white, rich, and yeah. privileged. I mean, and we've mentioned it already, but yeah. this movie is not very intersectional. 
No. With its with its feminism. It's almost entirely white. Like I, I mean, do we I, I what would, what is the first black character we meet in this movie? Do we meet a black character? Oh, yeah. no, we uh it's one of the people at the nail salon when we're learning the patent and bend and snap technique, which again that scene works on its own pretty well and that's something people like to sort of call back, right? But this movie becomes a musical out of nowhere and then just goes back to being a thing. Yeah. I w- I mean it's fine because it's entertaining in its own right, but again it's like it's putting a ceiling on like the what the movie achieves when it's so like back and forth about so many things. I don't know. I would have like like again like made a Broadway musical about this and I yeah. am curious if like there was more songs or musical numbers in the original script. You know, this. I think I was reading that there was there was way more music in the original conception of how they would shoot this. Right? Yeah. But I don't know. It still works pretty well as what it is. And again, another moment where where Enid is just the foil and she comes off as an ass, right? Yeah, that's that scene leaves a very sour taste. But it's own. like, but she's completely justified if she thought that somebody used that word. Well, in any situation, if somebody, if somebody, okay, thought they they call, called them some sort of derogatory term referring to any sort of community they were a part of, they'd be right to confront the person, wouldn't they? Yes, but does that okay that scene is implying one of two things both of which are problematic right um the first option is which is what kind of ellie implied there is that vivian made that up is that she was just like oh you know she called you that behind your back right um that makes vivian's almost instantaneous redemption problematic later on Um, yeah so it's like well still what the fuck was up with that and otherwise the character's just projecting that Ellie would have called her that and is acting upon that projection. Rather Which than again, I also just don't believe. Yeah. I refuse to like, I'm incredulous about that. I refuse to accept that, that that is what the, also that dress didn't rip movie. I know you're telling me that it ripped <laughs> because of that sound effect, but it totally did not. Um, but also that character did not just, project that onto Ellie because come on. Well, no, if you're going to set up the character as somebody who, oh my God, like it's just, she's so comically malicious. Yes. It's just like a well, joke. Everybody is Yeah, like this scene. I mean, I guess this is a harmless joke at the end. The costume thing. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know. I kind of see where Vivian's coming from. If like, my new fiance's ex-girlfriend showed up at his school completely unexpectedly and like was suddenly following him around. I'd kind of be like that too. Right. But this is not the way the movie is portraying that either. No, it's playing a game to, and the winner gets the guy. But the fact uh, the problem of it is that getting the guy is what defines you as a winner <laughs> instead of just being happy with whatever or doing what you want to do. Also, she takes this remarkably well. Well, I would have left immediately. Well, also, it is very much the performance. Yeah. Too. And this, this is the, oh my God, look at Oz Perkins. Yeah. He's just staring at her ass. (laughs) Yeah. Well, he looked away for a second, but he's like, hold on. Well, anyway, do you think he was thinking like, I'm going to dress up like that? (laughs) Yes. <laughs> she stole my costume idea. Mom, I have a new outfit for you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> mm. But I think the the thing I like about her performance... Oh, fuck. Another... Th- this, this movie cannot stop, like, just making... And then this movie forgets about this character for the majority of yeah. the rest of the movie. So there's no reason that she needs to be like Yeah, this. why does she still have to be, like, a fucking comical version of what a feminist is? But I guess what I was going to say before I got distracted with that is that uh, I think one of the interesting things about Reese Witherspoon's performance being so good in this movie and how it changes the actual like text of the movie is that, okay, do you think it is possible to comb through this movie and maybe look at it in a way where you think, 
okay, Elle is completely aware of how she comes across to other people, but she's just sh- so like determined to be her own person that she's not going to change regardless. Yeah, which I think is fine. Like, and like this scene kind of demonstrates that entirely where it's just like she instantly realizes that she's been tricked, but rather than just being like, oh, she still, she stays in the outfit. She has an objective. Yeah. Yeah. She stays in the outfit. She walks around and then we have this actually emotional scene. Yeah. And you know what? That, that, this is another moment of her doing the opposite of what you, you think with that ditzy blonde thing, where again, it's not just that she knows the shit she's into. Paul Walker. No. Paul Walker. It's not Paul Walker. It they CGI'd him it in. It doesn't even remotely look like Paul Walker. You need to rewind your VCR and see that because it is totally Paul Walker's secret twin. Uh, I know we argued about that for like 90 minutes. Last time. Yeah, but I won. But I, well, we'll see. Well, because Austin we'll actually started looking up to see if Paul Walker was an extra in Legally Blonde, which he was not, but... Maybe they didn't know he was there. <laughs> yes, maybe Paul Walker snuck onto set for that one thing. Yeah. But uh, I guess what I was going to say is like her doing that, again, it's a social thing, right? With the dumb blonde thing where the trick of portraying her as a as a character with like a true sense of agency is like that social aspect. You know, it's her being intelligent in the way she navigates through society instead of just navigating through a uh, a clothing catalog, Right. And that she can yeah. handle and interact with other people without changing herself. And that's why that scene works really well. And you know what? After you're saying that, I think I will rewatch this movie after this commentary with that in mind. Yeah. Because I really do wonder now if that changes the sort of subtext of every scene. Just because of her performance is that good. You know? Where you can be like, okay, she totally knows that she's coming across as ridiculous, but she still doesn't care because... She's not willing to change in order to conform to or to sort of like please people in a shallow way. Yes. She's right? like she doesn't see any conflict with her becoming like going to law school and becoming a lawyer and right. who she is right now. She and also despite the odds of alienating people because of the way she is, she still does it because she understands that's not her problem. It must be annoying to be one of the people in these classes who isn't one of the five recognizable characters we've been introduced to. So you're not allowed to answer questions. It is funny (laughs) if you look at the extras and it's like for every class, it looks like they're all sitting in the same spot. Yeah. I think (laughs) it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it's definitely different classroom sets to differentiate because otherwise I don't know if it is. I mean, they shot, they only shot those helicopter bits um, near Harvard. They couldn't, get Harvard to agree to shooting on campus. So they shot the rest of it at USC and UCLA. Oh, come on, Harvard. Why not? Because they're very serious. Well, no, they're not. You'll let anybody in Harvard. Um, I'm going to go to Harvard after watching this movie. You graduated from Harvard. Yes. In 1912. Back when only men allowed on campus, and as long as you weren't Irish or Jewish. Good times. By that, I mean, oh my God, it's probably still like that. But anyway, we're at this interesting scene where we see Ellie, one, motivate one of her friends to stick up for themselves, and two, start to use legal jargon in order to... Yeah, and also make a difference for somebody else. Yes. Because she uses it in a way that's incorrectly. I mean, well, 50% of the stuff she says is utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. But she does it with confidence. She does it with confidence, and the general idea of what she's saying is kind of correct. Like because you do habeas corpus, that yeah. movie with Bruce Willis and uh, oh my God, I'm forgetting her name. The movie with Bruce Willis, we all know love. <laughs> well, like that's right. Equal division of assets is like, that's a thing. If they had a common law marriage, then right. That would be true to get the dog. But again, also, I think this this scene is interesting because we one thing I didn't I don't think I mentioned about uh, why I really like this concept is because. The oh, yeah, she started yelling. 
But also it's kind of funny that he just lets them take it. (laughs) Like I want her to like yell at him and scare him away. I want her to say, I guess I want her to slap him onto the ground and then take the dog. But I'm happy we got to see the dog regardless. Look who I have to use. You don't have to necessarily have them slap them. Right. It's the whole idea is they can get what they want in the face. I don't socially though. I know that's the point. Yeah. Like if we're continuing the thread of her being like the opposite of Ellie kind of, but it is really fun to watch her hit people. Yeah. I imagine. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that is the thing. Yeah. If you could find a way to mix both of those in, that's like a good idea. But I guess the point I was making is that, okay, there's a unique thing about law school, right? When we see it exemplified in this thing where it's like, it is the specific type of pedantic arguments going back and forth, right? And in this, in this sphere that we have established is dominated by men, as it is in real life, right? It's a certain type of like male pedantry that I feel like is, is something that you see very frequently in the way men interact with women, right? Yeah. Where you point out something completely irrelevant to what you're talking about to, I don't know, reject what they're saying or not take them seriously. Also, this point, the one time I want to see the the feminist lesbian caricature character react to something Ellie says if she's not in the scene. Because she actually does make a good point that could be considered feminist right here. Well, that's totally something you would assume. I mean, I don't know. I would like to see that and then just like maybe have the girl just be like, oh, you know, I'm sorry I was too hard on you or something Instead, like you that. get the reaction shot from Oz Perkins, who <laughs> we already know is on board with her because yes. he got the book for her. Yeah, that would have been a better thing to do. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And then we get, because we see her clapping at the end of the movie, but we just have to assume that she likes her now. Yeah. Right? But if you had Enid actually in the scene, that helps with that a bit. But yeah, I mean, you know, I... And I think the thing about, you know, that being a back and forth argument, right, where you're getting away a little bit from the actual discussion at hand pragmatically, but it's revealing a certain type of ideology, right? And when you have the men being very pedantic towards women and using that to reject what they're saying, that is like a sexist ideology being represented. Yes. And I think that's why I think this movie connected with me on a strangely like personal level because you see that so frequently and I'm you know that is something I have definitely been part of on the male end you know what I'm saying not intentionally ever but there are definitely things I have done in just interacting with other people that dismiss what they're saying in that way real snow Oh, it's a, it's fine that it's not real snow. No, it is. This is a, in the tradition of classic Hollywood, Max. I know. If it were real snow, it'd be really disappointing. <laughs> it would have to be like a depressing scene in order for real snow to feel. But now we want. Oh, and now it's what? Okay. Oh, well, time has passed. Yes, time has passed. They can finally throw out those leaves they painted. I don't think that's a thing that would happen. What? Like, if you have a murder trial, like, you put the first-year interns on some of your bullshit cases, and then you take your better people to represent in the murder trial. And then we have her again, just being like, ugh. Not only does she give her the side eye, and it is basically, like, two inches away from her face. Yeah. Also, I'm a little bit confused why Selma Blair is so, like, taken aback by you that. You had sex with your ex-girlfriend? How dare you? Are you kidding me? Yeah. I still... I wonder if... I'm reading too much into this. Like, what? I wonder if that's a joke of just, like, he's not able to please her, get it up with her. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I agree with that 100%. So, like, that's why she's upset. Yes, let's just say that, Mm because that's amazing. Maybe he said he was a virgin, (laughs) and he can't... The thing was, he can't get it up. It took four hours for him to get it up, (laughs) and uh, he's afraid of consummating the... Well, not consummating the marriage. They're not married yet, but he's afraid of having sex with Selma Blair because he's afraid of his uh, uh, impotence being exposed. What did you... What was the phrase he used for, like, fan fiction? 
that you like write immediately in your mind? What head cannon? Yeah, head cannon. Yes. That's our head cannon. <laughs> And again, I've mentioned uh, conservation of, of detail and, and narrative uh, several times already in this show, right? But here's a big one where this trial starts in the middle of the movie, and now we're going to be introduced to a major character halfway through. And sometimes that works, but usually it helps to have some sort of establishment earlier in the film. Oh, by the way, we didn't mention it, but this is the very first time that you you get Luke Wilson's name. Yes, even though he's the primary love interest, apparently. Um, and we checked it. This is 53 minutes into a movie that's like 90 minutes. Yeah. That's it's, not It's okay. like the movie decided at this point. It's like, oh, yeah. I guess she needs it's a love so interest. It's so half-assed. Yeah. And it's like, if you, this movie is going to have a love interest be the end of it, when it is setting it up for that very definitively to not be the thing that happens... If you're going to actually shove a love interest into this, it has to be like, they have to do a lot of work to have that go over with the audience, right? Yes. And it does none of that. It's the most half-assed thing ever. But I guess, the, here's the thing. This character, Ali Larder, Ali Larder's character, is not entirely without any sort of setup in the movie because we see a lot of the sorority girls exercising at the beginning, Right. But we don't actually, I think, get any reference to her as a person. You know? We need one shot, maybe, of just them watching one of her, like, what they call it, like, butt bursting <laughs> videos or whatever. That's a funny joke. Yeah. I mean, why not? You can like dicks. You're allowed to like dicks, everybody. It would have been better if Selma Blair looked at the yeah. guy. Yeah, like a disapproving. Just like Or like... A disappointing yeah. look. No, yeah. Head cannon. He has a That's small so dick. a thing. He has a small dick. It's not it's not merely that it's small. It's that he he has no idea what to do with it. Yes. It's the worst of both worlds. Oh, is this the first black person we see in the movie? <laughs> yes. I'm, I was I guess I was thinking of the first black person with a speaking role in the movie. Yeah, I guess he just stands there. Yeah. Here's the other thing this is making me think of in terms of the movie's intersectionality, right? And ha well, the non-existent virtually intersectionality of this, where I've noticed a, n a few details in this movie that are sort of like, they remind me of the story of Cinderella, right? We're introduced to Elle. She puts on her slippers, right? Uh, her name is Elle. Yes. Right? And by the way, the writer went on to write Ella Enchanted as the very next movie. Really? She had some Disney classic fairy tales or not even the Disney version, just that type of fairy Disney tale. On her, yeah. yeah. That type of fairy tale on her brain, by the way, he's got a package. We can't just let that go. No. And they make, that's like, and I, they I bring that joke back later on. <laughs> <laughs> Reese, they, Wither, Reese Witherspoon plays the scene so amazingly, like yeah. the level of like, the wingman, the level. like winking, like of come it. on. But it's like it's not just that it's winking. It's like there's a certain level of like obviousness about her we winking that is perfect. Yeah, like she's winking, but she's absolutely not trying to hide the fact that she's winking. <laughs> yeah, I love that moment, and I love that the movie just committed to that joke 100. percent It's not like a smart joke, but it's like we're still doing it. <laughs> And then we go into this scene. Oh my God, it's the bend and snap. Yes, the, the most quotable thing in this movie. Now, Max. Max, okay. Okay. I'm going to... Oh, gonna... Austin is standing up. Austin's going to participate okay, in this so maneuver. We have our bend and snap here, right? We have our bend and snap. Oh my God, And audience. this is something I couldn't understand while actually watching the movie. I know it's supposed to be some sort of seduction thing. Yes. But is it because, okay, they bend down... It's supposed to be sticking your breasts out, right? As the thing is that you're not filming this on your phone. No, I'm not. Give me your phone. No, it's give fine. Me, give me your phone. Max, we have to talk about the movie. We are talking about the movie, but you're getting ready to do bend and snap. So. No, I, well, I'm not doing it now. Okay, fine. Everyone is going to have to live with that disappointment because you, you just could. Oh, 
I think it's funny that the, the that's woman, the first speaking role of a woman in color. Oh, well, not only that, but a it's like of color. it's like she she immediately seems to know what she's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> who doesn't know the bend and snap? Austin, I think you need to give it a try, honestly. But okay, but I still can't tell what is supposed to be seductive about it. You show off your ass and you show off your tits. That's the like I think literally that's or the entire Or you just stick it out? Was. Yes. Okay. So you have the ass and you Oh, and there's a gay man there too. Yeah. Well, the that's the real weird, baffling thing about this. Could I see your scene. bend and snap, Austin? No, you can't. Why? Because you're, you're filming it. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Here, stop I'll put, lying. I'll put my phone on the table. Right? It's too late. The scene's over. No, it's not. Do it. Do your bend and snap, Austin. No, that's going to be our uh, new Patreon goal. <laughs> okay, but what the fuck is this? Why did that character need to show up for the do- even the dogs? Who are- is that? Yeah. Who is that guy? <laughs> Who knows? He never shows up again. What is the what is the point of them doing that? I don't know. But uh, punching down. That's one of the things I have problems with. Like Do I know gay well, people? I don't even know if that's a punch. I just don't understand like, like what the purpose is. Okay, clearly he's playing like the flamboyant gay person. Yes. Right? Working at a you know, hair salon. And I have gay friends who like are like that to a degree, but like right. I don't, why is that in the movie? I well, it's know. not merely that they're a stereotype. It's yeah. fine for people to be stereotypes, as this movie is proving, right? But like, it doesn't do anything with the stereotype. There's literally no point for him to be in the movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know why that is in the movie because it's not like a joke. No, it's not. It just shows up and makes the. It just says something and then it's over. If like they tried to tie that into later, like. It's almost like him mentioning a fashion brand and then her being like, oh, gay guys, no fashion brands. It's the type of thing where it's like, we were talking about this. It seems like a celebrity cameo, right? Because it's like the laugh of recognition almost is what it seems to be, you know, implying. Yeah. It's like, is that somebody you recognize and then laugh because they showed up? Which is also really lazy. It's not like that's that makes it better, but... It's just completely confusing to us. If you know who that is, let us know, I guess. Mm. By the way, uh, one other thing we we really enjoyed um, about this is how this moment gives them a very genuine, well-acted connection, right? And uh, is like them expressing the, the their own sort of lives and similarities to one another, right? And then how how the movie immediately uh, sort of kind of abandons that. I don't know, like, well, it doesn't. Okay, he she never like even though that, like it's a silly joke, haha. But like they do get a genuine connection. She never betrays that trust, and in fact, that no, trust, she doesn't betray the trust. And that trust is like what leads her to fire Callahan after the whole shit goes down and I guess, trust this law student. But I feel like it's of such less consequence than I want it to be because of the gravity of this moment emotionally, right? And them bonding over this thing. Well, it shows, I, I guess it's like less the thing that matters and shows that like she's a personal, per, yeah, personable person who can gain trust and that's going to be a good asset for her as a lawyer despite the fact that people think she's Because she mu- takes people seriously. Yes. And she believes her clients. Like, right. Whereas like the head lawyer guy thinks that she's... And, and really it's sort of like a parallel to Elle herself, right? Where the lawyer and the other people on this team are cynical and kind of dismissive towards uh, Ali Larder because they see her the same way they see Elle is the thing, right? Yeah. And Elle doesn't make that mistake. She embraces the person she's talking to. Well, and they shouldn't because, like, this woman did make a fortune by herself and, like, married this husband out of her own choice. Who had a huge dick. Yeah. We all know it. Yes, we. the movie has stated that he I had I don't know how dick. you can get any happier in life. Yeah. But also, it's that like... That is weird. Like, I I do sympathize with the daughter character in this movie. Where it's well, just I, like, oh, that's a whole other weird thing. thing. Yeah. But, I mean, like... I guess the thing is, the we see this pay off in this moment where she refuses to tell, right? But it's also like, I feel like I want that to be expressed in a more dramatic way, you know? Like, it feels like she just, they press her for it and she says no, but we there's nothing at, at you know, sort of at stake here because it's like, she's just saying no to people who already treat her like shit anyway. You know what I mean? Mm. 
Yeah. It's not like we expect anything else to happen. We know Luke Wilson will be fine. Yeah. Right. And we know that everyone else will treat her like a dick. Yeah. So it's like what I don't really feel like something's at stake in that moment. So I guess the thing is she does stick to her guns on that, but it's like it doesn't really feel well, earned in we, the same way. We also see that like that scene served the purpose of showing us that Selma Blair is like getting over love interest man. And right. Coming. But I mean, you could find so many ways of doing that. You could. Yeah. And we've said that this isn't the best screenplay, but it's elevated by good performances. Right. And it is a genuinely fun enjoyable comedy film so yeah this is definitely the by the way speaking of the performances this is definitely the type of big budget studio movie that i really love and wish they made more of where they rely less on like a brand to sell something yes and they sell something with actors and just put really good actors in situations and we get to watch them do human things yes good acting in the glamour of hollywood i really love you relying on actors to deliver that because it's always fun. Like I always think when I'm watching those superhero movies, wouldn't it be more fun to just watch these people doing like a normal thing and being goofy. I and I always feel like not always maybe, but I usually feel like the answer is yes. I feel like that's a problem, you know? Yeah. Oh, here we get Raquel Welch. Yes. Who wasn't like, uh, does she, do you think she knows in the context of the movie? Cause it was her daughter that killed the husband. Right. So do you think the daughter can find that in her? And she's just like, oh dear, y'all take care of that. Well, if we're going to read into the, the, the uh, imagery of the film, she is, she does have a mask on right now. Yes. If we want to go with visual metaphors, then that's a thing. Yeah. That's a pretty, you know, would you say on the nose? <laughs> Metaphor. I love how that conversation, they stopped talking, got in a car, waited until night, and then picked up the exact spot. And it's interesting because he's not even moving his mouth. Yes. It's somehow ventriloquism, Max. (laughs) ADR. (laughs) He, like, started moving his mouth at the end when they were pulling up in front of the camera already. Like, oh, God. Yeah. That's painful, but it's fine. And also, I remember sort of voicing to you some annoyance with his lines where he talks about the advantages of her being blonde and then just doesn't specify whatsoever. Well, I, and I said, I thought that it was because like people are going to underestimate her because she's blonde. So, and, and you could take this scene as it of just like, it gives you an advantage where it's like, she's going to help out Oz Perkins because Oz Perkins has helped her out before. And she's using the fact that, yeah, I guess she is using what she just, yeah. But she just learned to help him out. Yeah. And at the same time, an, an acknowledgement of certain things because of her stereotype that give her an advantage that Oz Perkins might lack in certain situations. Right. Yeah. Although Oz Perkins, if those girls are being mean to you, you know, you, you don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to be with them. This is a fun line. By the way, we have not mentioned it, but Oz Perkins is Anthony Perkins' kid. Yeah. And it's weird watching the commentary because they mention him and then they don't seem to connect those dots when they're talking about him. So I started wondering, like, did he tell anyone? Did some people <laughs> somehow not know that he was he was the child of Anthony Perkins? He just showed up on the set and he's like, I'm in the movie now. And they're just like, well, I, mean, I guess we can't say no. That is so weird. He's I so wonder, confident. Has anyone like talked to him about that? I'd love to. Such like, a contrast to like what I would expect. But I don't know. Maybe they can do a team up. <gasps> can you imagine Elle Woods? This is the fun thing about these types of movies where you have really great actors doing a good character. Yeah. Can you imagine Elle Woods doing a haunted house thing? <laughs> Trying to like exercise a haunted house full of ghosts? Sure. I'll watch that movie. Or it's like the Wicker Man with Elle Woods. No, okay, let's not get too much into <laughs> what ifs now. That's There's just endless possibilities. Pointless and crossover all of them stuff are good. is what annoys me. Or it's, it's like those Hot Topic shirts. It doesn't like, have to be crossover, but I'm just saying in terms of the concept. She has to investigate a cult yeah. or something. And again, this is yeah. one of the things that the movie gets really right. You know? No, I like at this point in the movie, I believe they'd start to bond. Like, 
if they're working together on the same thing and she's becoming frustrated with her fiance. And I think that's why we feel like it works overall, yeah. despite its shortcomings in other areas, because this relationship between the two of them becomes the primary uh, sort of emotional fabric of the movie. You know what I mean? She has a relationship with Allie Larder's character, but it's a little bit different, yeah. you know? Um, whereas these two reconcile something that's been established since very early on in the film. You know what I mean? So it's a reversal and we buy the reversal and both of the actors are good. So it helps in that way too. Oh, there's a dog barking. Yeah. Bruiser was loud. Yeah. That looks so much like a building at my old school. I think that, crazy. I think that is a campus building. That has to be. Yeah. Uh, well, or courthouse, right? Well, that I look, don't know. It looks like a campus building. Like, I don't know. I've I've seen courts in New England, and they don't tend to look like that. But what are you doing? Whatever. Have you seen all of them, Max? No, I have not. So, Well, there you go. To, Technically, that was shot in California, it's though. It's the so. legally blonde people who are just like, I'm actually, that's the very famous <laughs> door snorting. Who is this? Who is not Ellen Page here? Her face looks like Ellen Page, but Ellen Page was not. Speaking of them. faces, do you see the guy sitting down next to that lawyer? No, I don't. That looks like Anthony Perkins, too. Kind got of lots yeah. of people. Lots of people who are not actually the people we think they are. Luke the, Wilson's face is funny in that scene. Somebody tell me who the daughter in Legally Blonde is. I, I need to know because it looks like... You yeah, can just look it up. I tried. I couldn't find it. There's no information on it anywhere. Okay. Like there's pictures of her and then like no information. It might be a non-credited role, but... Okay. But here we go, Max. Yes. It's not just that he is a gay stereotype, right? It's no. that he's a gay... I didn't want to get here. Latin American stereotype. We see it soon. In a moment that, in abstract, is funny, like a funny joke, the whole, like, don't you tap your last season shoes at me, yeah, bitch. <laughs> is that what he says? No, it's your last season, what is it, Prada, Gucci? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's she right. kn she kn he knows that what season they're in and he knows the brand of it. That's okay, how we yeah. know he's gay. Right. Also, it's, you know, he, like meaning meaninglessly sexualized. Yeah. In that scene because he's gay. It's not specifically. Well, to be fair, this guy is sexualized too. Like, but. Right. But we also see something into his subjectivity. It's clear to us that he has a thing for her. Right? Yeah. And also... Which is nice. He shows up in the movie first, and then we learn about him. Yeah. It's not like he shows up out of fucking nowhere. To be a stereotype, yes. Yeah. And then to be a punchline, more than just a stereotype. No, and like, even though things go disastrously here, and this scene is a joke, like... Yeah. You know, in fact, he is the exact opposite treatment. No. Because she does something accidentally bad to him, and we see that he is so willing to embrace her that he doesn't care. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we have to infer that he's a good person. Well, right? Yeah. And we have the wonderful line, which brings up a movie we've also done on the spectator film podcast before, but Oh, the Blair witch thing. Yeah. I mean, that comes right before it. And that's a really weird joke too. Well, yeah, if you're going to throw up at any, yeah, here we go. But again, I like this moment in abstract as a joke, maybe. If you remove just the stereotype aspects of it, it's kind of funny that she gets cut and then she just starts passive aggressively tapping her toe. Yeah. <laughs> and the way she does it is hilarious. But also, he's literally wearing a, like a bedazzled thing with like... The Virgin Mary on yeah, the back? Yeah, like... Last season Prada. Okay, I'm sorry. I, had, I was naming every other fashion band except Prada. Um... He's gay. Right. He knows what Prada is. But it's like, I also kind of just don't buy that she would come to that conclusion. We literally have evidence in the movie that she is not going to judge somebody for being gay. Yeah. When she says, I don't use that word when talking to Enid, right? Well, no. It's, it's not very strong evidence. I don't use slurs, but like, I guess she's... Also, it doesn't make sense as like a thing, I think. Well, where no, she's okay. a sorority girl, right? But it's like, I know she's really into fashion, 
Let's, she majored in it. She graduated with a degree in fashion What I'm saying is it is so fucking out of the blue because there is no presence of a gay man in the film aside from them being in the, in, in like the nail salon. Yeah. Where it's like, why is it necessary? And like, it's just so fucking random. You know what I mean? That wouldn't make it better necessarily if it was set up, but it might somehow force them to think about it more and do it in a way that's less like appalling to you. Like this just feels like somebody punching you in the stomach. What is about to happen? Yeah. Because as you mentioned, it's not just that they make a joke out of it about him being gay. Right. It's that he's, he, they lit. I know he's lying and that he's a bad person for lying and trying to incriminate somebody, but they literally out him in public. Yeah. And it's played as a joke. And also, okay. I, I know I live in a different time. I, as a bisexual male, I would like to remind people that we bisexuals do exist and you can sleep with a woman and also sleep with men. It is physically possible. Right. And then this fucking guy. Yeah. You bitch. And then walks away. Also, if you were, why would you be there? Yeah, it's weird. Why would your closeted gay lover be? Th- okay, whatever. Whatever. This joke was written this by j- someone else. Yeah. I don't know. It's such an easy, lazy And the lesbian's joke. on board with that. Oh. Yeah. It's like, what the hell is going on in this movie? Uh. Whiplash is the correct term. Because it's, mm. it's completely the opposite of what, of, of like what you think this movie is about. And this scene, which kind of comes out of nowhere. I'm kind of glad it's in the movie because it grounds it in a real serious, like serious tone that like, I don't think it comes out of nowhere entirely, but not entirely, but like I'm talking tonally because like this movie has had ups and downs tonally, but everything's played yeah. kind of silly. This is played very straight and I'm glad they did that. Cause if you tried to play it goofy at all, it would undermine the seriousness of this. Yeah. I'm glad they didn't make a fucking joke out of this. Jesus. And it highlights very real world consequences that women getting into male dominated fields can face, which by the way, I haven't mentioned it, but there are several scenes in this movie that make me feel kind of uncomfortable. I think in completely in an unintentional ways, the way she's walking home after the date and he's like, get in the car, you yeah. know what I mean? Like stuff like that, where it's like, it makes you feel weird <laughs> and a little bit nervous. Passive misogyny. Well, it's, well, it's not, it's not misogyny. It's like specifically the threat of some sort of like assault or something or like this weird, like vapor of it hanging in the air. Yeah. I mean, even the way they did that shot, I mean, credit to the cinematographer, who, by the way, shot all of Nicholas Rogue's movies. Really? It's very weird. Uh, like, Don't Look Now. The guy who shot Don't Look Now shot this movie. Um, but well, a f- the way they did that shot where she just enters the room, it's immediately ominous. Somehow in the way they position the bodies, right? And the type of lens they use and the way it compresses. Also, why does she like run away here instantly? Like, you think that... I like- mean, what would you do? Well, I mean, it's a different circumstance, but yeah. I, I can sympathize with somebody just seeing that and like, and, and leaving, right? Not what would you do? That's a bad way to phrase that. But also, let's not forget that she actually draws the completely wrong conclusion about it. Yeah. She thinks it's a consensual thing that's going on and that it's actually a tool that Elle has used to her advantage but also doesn't make sense when she sees Elle clearly distraught, leaving immediately after. Yeah, and doesn't give her a chance to explain herself whatsoever. Right. I would be like, um, are you fucking kidding me? I was just sexually assaulted, and that's the... Oh my god, whatever. I don't know. It's hard for me to say what I would do in that yeah, situation. Yeah, that's true. You know what? I'm looking really at it from a very male perspective. And if you're just traumatized and like... I don't know if it's a male perspective so much as it is just you always think you're going to do a thing. It doesn't even have to be like any sort of sexual harassment or anything, right? But again, this moment too, I'm glad it plays this straight. And that it chooses this as a type of yeah. uh, low point for the character, right? where this this works because this this again grounds this Barbie doll in the real world, right? It's 
it's taking the character and putting them in the real world, and now there are consequences for them emotionally, and now they're going to quit because of something that happened to them that happens to lots of people. Like you, I want to point out this scene. What a lame ass thing to say to somebody. Yeah, he's like the thing he fucking said. Oh, screw him. Screw him. He could stay here. First of all, I think the first thing to say is is maybe not to argue with them or to disagree with them about what's going on, but to give them a chance to elaborate on how they're feeling yeah. to somebody. And I mean, I think if I was in that situation, I would I would try to encourage somebody to not do what she's doing, which is drop out, but it wouldn't be the first thing out of my mouth. Yeah. Oh, God. She does talk about that she doesn't even think her parents take her seriously, which is in the five seconds we've seen them is a true statement. Yeah. No. And I really like the dialogue in the scene because it's a little bit of a departure from the, uh, the type of dialogue that she says in the rest of the movie, because the rest of the dialogue dialogue is very emblematic of her personality. Yeah. Right. And this is the scene where and I'm just like, yeah, this reveals a different layer to everything that's been going on with her that we don't see as frequently where she is aware on a certain level of, you know, the world she's in and what people think of her. And this is a great moment by the way, but this yeah. is literally the third time we've seen this character. We didn't mention this when we, when we talked about this character before, but we actually get the moment we're asking for. It just feels unearned in my opinion. I don't know if it, me- if, it, if it feels unearned so much as like, it seems both to us, I think like there is so much more room there for that sort of back and forth between those two characters. I don't know. Maybe if you cut out, you know, the romantic interest in this, there might be more room for developing the relationship between Reese yeah. Witherspoon and, and Professor Professor Stromwell. Yeah. Also, we see Luke Wilson respond to Selma Blair after this joke. Yeah. In a way that actually gives his character texture. Right? But does he actually respond to the other guy that way? He doesn't do anything to the other guy. He just defies him when he says, I'll supervise her being the uh, counselor. Right? Yeah. But he's, as far as we know, like he's met with him several times. He was going to meet him when L walked out. Did he say anything to him? Yeah, I don't know. He just didn't do shit, I guess. Well... He is like a under like practice. He started his own practice at the end of the movie, so he's part of Callahan's law firm at the moment. But oh my god, that's maybe not the best outfit choice if you're trying to be like I didn't kill my husband. That she's yeah. wearing a suit, isn't? Or, oh no, okay, yeah, she's wearing that's like a, a shiny necklace, a shiny necklace and cleavage. That's a very I killed my husband outfit, but right. But also the movie is making a point with that sort of thing too. Yes, where it's like, you know. She's about to walk in here in all pink. Right. Who cares, though? Because she can still win this case. Right. That's the point. And she does. And you can win the case wearing all pink. Yes. You can be you and accomplish your dreams. And you can have a tall man walk behind you (laughs) with a book wearing sneakers. I love how she closes the gate on Oz Perkins and he just kind of stands there. He's like, okay, I guess that's fine. It's way more amusing to me that it's Oz Perkins than the actual, like, character or even the performance. I like how, how this judge gets annoyed. Yeah. (laughs) People might've noticed. I I enjoy when people get like kind of passive aggressive about things. Really? Yeah. Also, we also talked about this, but we really appreciated the way the other lawyer responds to this yeah in your office dot 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 and we kind of wished that it was more of a wide shot so other people responded to but i it is enough i guess for just the other lawyer to respond yeah because it does so much to to add this other layer to this 
other lawyer character. Oh, God. I'm fine with those <laughs> two showing up. Okay, yes, I know what you're going to say. The Vapid Sorority Sisters, who, like, they have depth, we've had that, but, like, they don't show any of it here, and it kind of detracts from the scene, in my opinion, but that's just me being Yeah, do you blank. think uh, they would be, what, taken into custody for contempt of court or whatever? Yeah, Immediately. probably. Immediately. Literally, like, five seconds ago, it would have happened. Yeah. Definitely would not say that. No, get out of my courtroom right now. Right. Being disruptive in a murder trial. A celebrity murder trial, nonetheless. Like. Also, how did they know? How is this place not swarming with media? Who are you? Why do you look familiar? She's just a person. She's just a person that happens to look like Ellen Page to you. She looks like Ellen Page. She, lo- she looks like a bunch of different actresses. I just want to know which one it is so I can not be annoyed. Also, we both agree that uh, L clearly has to be the one to win this case. Yes. For the concept of the movie. But also, I don't know. Like a lot of things in this movie, I feel like it's just missing a few things. And it's harder for me to point to a certain thing with this climax. But it's like I want her to somehow take control in, in a more thorough way, I think. Yeah. And also one thing we talked about is how it is important for her to use the person that she always was and the things she liked and the things that defined who she was and her interests as a relevant thing for winning this case. But also I feel like when you have it, it's so close. It's like an inch away, but what ends up happening is that she wins the case by by trapping this person in a lie yes. about perms, right? So she's using something she knows to win the case, demonstrating its validity and validating who she is a, as a character, right? When she wins, that's what happens. But she, I, I get where you're going, but, but continue. there's no, I want it to be a little bit more mixed with her taking in what we've established as the quote unquote male terminology of the courtroom and showing that she has conquered that in a way we get it a little bit at the beginning but it's kind of timid and indecisive like i want her to do the same thing with like maybe one or two words that are like legal terms because it shows a complete control over the environment well i think it's supposed to try to make it believable because like she's like she is still a first year law student that never has studied law before in her life so, like, she is having the not Owen Wilson help her um, with the legal stuff, but she shows a degree of understanding of that, and this shows why she's the perfect person for this case. It makes sense in the context of the movie. But also, it's like I want her to be demonstrated to be the perfect person for every case. You know what I'm saying? I guess, but... I guess we're supposed to gleam that from the fact. I don't know. By the end of the movie. I guess I'm also taking for for granted that the realism of this is not an issue anymore. You know, like I just want her to win in a way that seems more total, you know, Uh, because you totally buy that she's mounting this convincing argument and that she's going to win this case, especially once she starts being confident like this. But it's like, it's like, I want, I want her to beat, people on not only on her own terms right but i want her to take the terms that previously had been used to dismiss her and reject her and use those terms to defeat people basically at their own game right or prove her validity on everyone's terms i guess maybe that's wrong too i don't know Mm. the important thing is that it does accomplish the uh the goal of of using who she is as a person to to validate her humanity right in a very big way. She does use science terms, which shows that she's using her knowledge of that and like more than you would expect. Of just like, oh, you yeah. can't show after her. But she's like, no, she knows the science behind it. Yeah. I mean, I guess the thing is that it's a nitpick is what I'm saying. But also one thing we haven't yeah. mentioned with the daughter character is how it's yet another character who's evil 
and yet also like is also a woman. Right? Yeah. So it's like it's I think the lawyer like her lawyer would have cut her off right now. Yeah. But I mean, even aside from that, it's it's the fact that the movie it's okay for female characters to be bad people. Yeah. Right? But it's the fact that this movie is built on inclusivity, embracing this Barbie character, and yet it's like I feel bad for the daughter. Like I understand that. Well, like, I, I don't think you're meant to though. And I think that's part of the the yeah. problem is like it is it is using these characters entirely as props and then dismissing them. Yeah. And maybe it would be different. It wouldn't feel that way if it was established earlier in the movie, because then they would feel more like characters that they thought about when making the movie instead of literally showing up just for L to dunk on. And then we celebrate. Yeah. It's way too easy. Like I get like, I would be weirded out if, like my dad died and my mom started dating a 20, like six year old boy. I just okay. like, that's a little weird, but you're not condoning the murder thing. No, I'm not condoning the murder, but, but you're like, saying there's an angle there. There's an, there's a sympathetic angle, which like you didn't need to do that. You could have written a character that's just like completely unsympathetic whatsoever. And like, I don't know. Okay. I'm not I'm really on board with the unsymp. I don't really have sympathy for somebody who killed somebody. Okay. But oh, okay. If we're going to go on record and say the spectator film podcast does not condone murder in any situation. Sure. But well, I'm not I saying feel that bad either, for that character. I'm not saying that Max. Okay. <laughs> God forbid I make a point. No, I, I guess what I'm just trying to say is like, it just feels again, not well established. And then when you just have her, again, dunk on another woman like that, and the same thing with Enid, it's like, well, what is, what are you telling me? Yeah. I wish, I would have liked Enid not to be a stereotype. I would have liked the person that she destroys in the case yeah. to be, I don't know. It would have been nice if, like, I don't know, she even, like, because, like, Callahan just kind of walks away from this movie, doesn't he? Like, he Yeah, you know what? You're making me think of something. It is downright annoying to me how much screen time we get of these useless male characters. Yeah, kind of. Like when we have all these other female characters just like waiting there to do other things in a movie. To do better things with. Like we could have used more scenes of her rather than Callahan. We could have like just cut fucking Luke Wilson out of the movie. First yeah, of all. Yeah, we didn't really need him. Oz Perkins is fine. Oz Perkins, is, you know what? Have uh, Enid be the TA like have her be the person you need to I don't know and then she's annoyed constantly that like despite being an equal footing lawyer Callahan's always like yeah. making her get coffee oh it's just oh here we have the callback to that right yeah which I, I wonder if like but there I feel was like... there was more of a built up relationship I know that they shot a different ending I can't yeah. really remember it but I know it was something that tested poorly and I think it had to do with uh um, Luke Wilson proposing to her immediately after this. Yeah, God. Um, Thank God they didn't go with that. But still, it feels a little bit like studio notes or producer notes, you know, like yeah. from from the money people. But you uh, have to have a happy. End. She has yeah. to get a man. Everybody wants a man, right? It looks like Don Corleone mm-hmm. in that shot, or Andy Garcia. But again, we have these moments. But I want the the bringing up the Aristotle thing, not just to be like, uh, this, this affirmation of, of what it is to work as a lawyer. <laughs> yes. The greatest, the, the greatest, greatest callback in this movie. He still is the Martian. And perhaps of all time. Yes. Um, but I mean, I want that moment with the Aristotle thing to come maybe right before the trial as like a reminder of the stakes too. And what's on the line. You know what I mean? Definitely. Okay. So we're getting the, what happened after. Yeah. They're now best friends. So that is perfect. That's earned. I believe that. This is I believe this. Yes. I really just don't care enough about this guy to... No, but I believe that happened to his character from what's established. Sure. Why not? I'm happy about that. That's fine, too. There you go. It may have not been earned, but I'm okay with that. Like, that's I think their their subplot is fine. Okay, I'm fine with this. That sentence is fine. Yeah. 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 I wish they had just been partners in the law firm. Yes. He's offering it instead of proposing. He's offering Ellie a job at the firm today. Like, to yeah. Surprise her. Okay. How about that? Or, or par- how about a partnership? Yes. With the firm. Partnership. Even better. They all have way too many names in yeah. law firms. You can add uh, Woods to one yes. of them. 
Oh, God. Because, like, I had forgotten this happened. Like, that... No! Yeah, this, this is where it loses me. Why? 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 We have seen them have had no romantic chemistry other than her support. They're literally in the same scene together, like, several times. Yeah, but, like, it's more of a, like, I support your career choice thing, more of a... Yeah, like, and I, I mean, know. even even aside from that, it's just... It's weird. The 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 idea of of the like romance being a thing that 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 is the result of the happy ending instead of her just doing. You could be she could be dating somebody else and yeah. they don't even say it. You don't have to say it. You know what I mean? Oh, I already found somebody else. Like right, but it's like, why does the romance part have to be explicit as a like a, a required thing of a happy ending? Is yeah. is the yeah. unfortunate thing about this? And then just the extra annoyance of, you know, how he's going to propose to Elle, like, while she's graduating Harvard. Yeah. That's something you see make the rounds on the internet a lot. It's like the public proposal thing. How can this day get any better for this Harvard Law top graduate? Click here to find out. Well, it's not just that. It's like, it, that's always what it's sold as. It's like a saccharine sweet thing. Yeah. But it's like... Oh, no, literally... It's yeah. always a man proposing... And then, it, like, there are so many where it's like the woman is in the middle of something. <laughs> well, yeah, like, also and then they propose to them. Every girl I've ever talked to about proposals said they would punch their partner in the face if they did a public proposal. Well, it's like awkward that. as fuck. It pressures you into saying yes. You only do that if you're not sure they're going to say yes because it pretty much guarantees that they're going to say yes. Is it a malicious? I'm sure it is sometimes, but I wouldn't assume not necessarily, necessarily malicious. But like, I don't think you think it's There's through. lack of a self awareness. Where there. like you're yeah. going to be like, oh well, this will be great because of course, like you don't know if they're going to say yes or not. Like, yeah, do it in an intimate setting where it's just the two of you because if you really want it to be the two of you for the rest of your life then you got to do it like maybe be comfortable with the answer they're going to give you to your okay. face coolest proposal moment ever okay let's hear the original spy kids movie <laughs> with antonio baderas who we, we all know is suave yes and he they're they they're both i think they're like in vienna or monaco or something watching fireworks and then what he does is he has the the box right yeah and they're they're both looking they're on this balcony and they have their hands on the balcony. And he puts his hand with the box on the balcony and he slides it across the balcony perfectly to her. And yeah. it's and it opens at the end. <laughs> without falling off the balcony railing. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine if Spy Kids did that. So if he could do that. If it just fell off halfway through and it's like, oh, fuck, there's a ring in there. Will you marry me? Well, they're, they're spies. I'm sure it flies or something. Yeah. It's a magic it has a little, gadget ring. It has a jet pack on the bottom of it. Yeah. Anyway, we're talking about Spy Kids, so I think... I'm just saying that proposal, that is my recommendation. Okay. Whereas, like, I know that's probably shooting for the moon. But if you can get to something like that, you know, there's no pressure there. A thousand miles? Oh, uh, wait. I thought this was... Uh, I thought that was the... Uh, what? I thought I sound th of Milwaukee. What are we looking at? I was thinking of uh, 500 miles by the proclaimers. <laughs> I'm like, wait, that song's in this movie. That'd be great if it was, but it doesn't really fit the tone. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I think overall, again, just to repeat our conclusions that this movie, yes, feminist movie, right? Um, it's about sure. women. It's about the idea of not only exploring the, the female sort of consciousness and, and, and sort of uh, perspective in a world that is patriarchal, but also talking about how she can conquer those specifically like gendered uh, obstacles, right? That are not in her favor. Yes. I would say it is a feminist movie. It is not the feminist movie. It is not a strongest case of a feminist movie. And as a film in general, it's kind of problematic, but it's, Right. It's an enjoyable comedy that does have a surprising, surprising amount of feminism in it, which was refreshing. Despite not being perfect. Despite not being perfect, which was refreshing to me when I rewatched it. And it's it. really hard to resist enjoying this. Movie. Yes, it, 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 it's, in, it's a very likable movie. It's it, hard to not yeah. just sit back and enjoy it, which is more than can be said about a lot of movies I've watched. So. And I think the thing is, we, when we think about the third one, you and I are both very, we feel optimistically curious. No. No, I don't trust. I do. It. Okay, well, well, I feel like I inherently don't trust sequels. So that's... I understand that you have a bias. Yeah, but also I feel like if you make this movie now, even if it's just however many years later, like 10, 15 years later, I feel like the same people writing this movie now, there's a better chance they squash all the uh, uh, or quash whichever one you want to go with 
all the unnecessary like punching down towards other marginalized communities and they focus more on a type of intersectionality and they can do a similar thing with it and it might be more successful. And the thing is, the real thing you can rely on is Reese Witherspoon because her performance in this is amazing. Yeah, well, I guess, see, you're thinking of the optimistic way. My way is they're going to miss the clever parts of this movie that made the original, like, made this great, and they're just going to go right for silly, blonde, because, like, it's going to be... the, like, it, feminism gonna, pandering thing. Either, I'm not even worried about that. Like, you can, we can talk about the Ghostbusters controversy, right. whatever, but I don't... Which is, is, again, what Anna Biller is talking about yes. in her blog post. But, um... That's not what I'm concerned about. Um, if they did that for that movie, I'd find that inoffensive, honestly. Um, right. But if they ignore that aspect entirely and it's just a producer being like, this is experiencing a resurgence right now because the people who grew up with it are coming of age. Oh, you mean they're completely oblivious? They're completely oblivious. Just make a dumb blonde runs for the White House thing. I feel like that's much more likely to happen than them putting any sort of fucking thought process into Legally Blonde 3. Like I'm I very strongly disagree. Okay. With you. Well, when the movie comes out, we'll if it comes out, I don't know how if far it along comes out. It yeah, is. but we'll we'll talk about it then. But I mean, then, I think the feminism thing though I know you're wanting to finish up, but let me just say, I think it would be enough I think of we're a strong out of things to talk about. If you have more, I'll gladly hang around. I'm just saying in terms of a third one, I think it is very much a thing where people producing it as, again, you're right. Somebody at the top can change everything, right? Yeah. But as long as the person at the top making the, like in charge of the decision making is able to err on the right side, right? Or, or just give the people the control to do a similar type of thing, but also focus on the same goals. Because this is not, again, this is not feminist merely because it's about, an empowered or strong female character, even though, again, we, I don't think either of us like the term strong female character because it's not descriptive in any no. sense. Um, but it's like the but, point is about her as a woman can I succeeding bring up a point real quick? in becoming, proving her equality. What? Um, neither of us have seen the sequel to this movie. No. I think that might be a good indicator on how seriously they took the franchise after this movie came out. So, Well, apparently they cashed in, right? is from what I would assume, because nobody talks about the second one. Well, yeah, so I don't understand why anybody would talk about the third one either. But Because it's a completely different thing now. Okay. Well, it's not like another cash-in <laughs> two years later. I'm not that passionate about this, so I'm not going to continue. I'm saying that I have an interest in that. Okay. And well, if they made it, I would probably go see it. You know, if it goes out in theaters, let's make it a date. I will go to see Legally Blonde we'll 3. We'll do a commentary live in the theater. Yeah, and get annoy, thrown ever, out. Yeah, no, but I will I will go see it in the theaters with you if Legally Blonde 3 gets released to the theaters. If it got released, it wouldn't be released to... to no, it's probably going anything. straight to streaming, yeah. but still. Uh, it, uh, no, what I said is that it would go to theaters. It wouldn't go straight to streaming. I something. don't know about that. But It'll be a big thing. People would recognize it. We'll see. But, but anyway, are you excited for Legally Blonde 3? Are you excited for this commentary to end? Are you excited to listen to more commentaries? Uh, yes, to two of those. I'll well, leave it up to the listeners to guess which ones. Okay, well, either way, you can go visit our website at spectatorfilmpodcast.com where we have all, all the social media stuff. Yes. And uh, Tumblr, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. No, there's no Facebook. I you know. always say this. I know. Is this a joke? Yes, to me, because it gets you angry. I'm not angry, I'm just... No, we're, we're on Tumblr, Instagram, and Twitter. Follow us there. Um... Yeah, like you said. Well, we now I'm angry. I'm good. Why isn't there a Facebook, Max? Because you wouldn't let me make one. That's right. Sorry. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we're, we're all out of time, folks. But yeah, we like this movie, and uh, we hope you did too. We hope you liked our commentary on this movie, and we yeah. hope you continue to like it in the future. Bye. <laughs>